So, to, to quote someone famous, is a pretty good crowd for a Saturday. Um, those of you who are still awake and still here, thank you. It's usually, there, there are more of you here than there usually are. I, I often get this slot. Management of distal radius non-unions. You guys have probably heard more about distal radius fractures in the last 24 hours than you care to. A couple of the take-home messages are going to be echoed. I'll try not to repeat some of the things that were done, and I'll try to make this brief. So, oh, and I have no disclosures. What, what defines a malunion? Well, malalignment of a fracture of the distal radius that's associated with dysfunction, with the emphasis on associated with dysfunction. Loss of mobility, loss of strength, loss of functional ability, secondary to uh, hand stiffness, or pain, be it persistent fracture pain, idiopathic pain, nerve pain, whatever. Those things can all qualify under the heading of dysfunction. But a radiographic malunion doesn't always result in dysfunction particularly in older people and, and people of low demand. I'll tell you a little anecdote. Uh, when my mother was in her young 80s, she broke her hip. She had that nailed. A month later, she broke her other hip. She had that nailed. And on each successive recovery, she lost some cognitive function just because. So she got back home, and she was fixing her bed, tripped over the bed, the, uh, Bedspread broke a wrist. Typical quote unquote Collie's fracture. You guys know I hate that term. But really deviated prominent ulnar styloid. And she lives in Bethlehem, so Dr. DeLong was going to take care of her and told me what he was going to do to fix it. And Matulo got involved, and I said, Time out. She loses any more cognitive function, doesn't matter what you fix. And she lived to be 89. She forgot most things except for the fact that. Her son was a hand surgeon. So she would tell people, look at this thing. My son's a hand surgeon. <laughs> Mom, does it hurt? No. Is there anything you can't do? No. So why does it look like that? So that, that sort of changed my philosophy in some regards. Anyway, uh, malunions take the form of shortening, translation, angulation, displacement, uh, intraarticular, either radiocarpal or radio ulnar. Um, and sometimes all of the above. So you've got to sort of pick it apart if you're going to try to decide what the, uh, what the issue is. What's the incidence? Like any other thing, like a scaphoid nonunion, um, who has it? We don't, we don't even, if people aren't complaining of it, we don't know how many of them have it if you're just going to define it radiographically. And there's a difference between symptomatic malunions and radiographic malunions. We do have cutoffs, like we do for everything, because we like numbers that there are predictors for instability uh, that are just like the predictors of a fracture that at least theoretically we're taught should be fixed. And that's one that has greater than a dorsal angulation of 10 degrees is shorter than uh, you'll see three millimeters. I think yesterday's numbers or this morning's numbers were four millimeters. I'm not sure my eyes can see the difference between three and four millimeters, even if I'm measuring it. So it's sort of a, a gestalt where, yeah, that looks short. And these people looked at 1,296 uh, distal radius fractures, 744 of them met the radiographic criteria for malunion. 5% of them had symptoms that required treatment. Again, just emphasizing you're not treating the x-ray, you're treating the problem. What are the risk factors from malunions? Particularly in this, this is mostly in, in ones you're going to treat non-operatively. And uh, when you enter your seventh decade of life, you get offended by all of these in the older patient, and the number they use is 60? Come on. Anyway, greater than 20 degrees of dorsal angulation, metaphyseal comminution, that just has to do with whether it can support itself, comminution extending to the vulvar cortex. And again, the age old, if you see what a fracture looks like the day it comes in, if you're going to treat it closed and it has comminution and it has dorsal angulation, no matter what you do to it, closed, it's probably going to end up like that. So if that looks like something that's acceptable to you in a patient who has criteria that would make them not a candidate, then let it heal as a malunion and they'll probably function or deal with it later. Associated ulnar fractures, displaced articular fractures, osteopenia, high energy mechanisms of energy are, are sort of uh, self-explanatory that they're going to be problems. Okay, so you put them in a cast, you may achieve acceptable alignment and mobility, you may lose it. Remanipulation has been shown to not be successful, so if you try a closed reduction and it doesn't stay where you want it, don't do it again. 
either accept it or do something greater if you're trying to prevent the malunion that you think might be symptomatic, but you're not sure. Percutaneous pins alone, same thing. They'll often wiggle, often wiggle off of it, particularly if there's comminution, and as we heard earlier today, external fixation. Uh, recommendations now are you should supplement them with something, either some percutaneous pins or uh, a little plate or some bone graft or something to help augment it so you can take the pins off sooner. Uh, Non-lock plates in osteopenic bone. Is, are there any lo non-locking plates in the world anymore? I don't, I don't think so. I think they all have at least that capability. In any event, I don't, I don't mean to bash it because I think it made a big difference in our ability to treat the ones that we need to. But non-lock plates obviously are, are becoming a dinosaur. And as I said, if you have pins or X fixators uh, on them and you take them off early, whatever that means, uh, things could subside. So symptoms are usually some type of pain in a patient who has a, quote, symptomatic malunion. They may have paresthesias, they may have weakness, they may have stiffness. Uh, but the stiffness that they're complaining of may not be in the wrist, it may be in their fingers. And Overall, they're going to describe some type of dysfunction. I can't do this. I'm a big fan of asking a patient when they're complaining of things, well, what is it you can't do because of it? And in, at least in my clinical practice, when I have a patient who's, I chose not to operate on and the x-ray looks kind of like, well, that's not perfect. It doesn't meet those criteria. And at the end of whatever it is, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, when you're sort of tired of seeing them and they're complaining, but their complaints aren't real valid, I have no problem sending them away. So look, Let's live with this for three months, come back in three months and tell me specifically what bothers you and then we'll decide whether there's anything we can do to change that because there may not be. When you examine them, you have to examine everything. There's no guarantee uh, or assurance that their complaint is coming from the radiographic malunion. Check their motion. You heard yesterday in the keynote and again today and I think everyone would realize it, that the most important motion is pronation and supination. People with fused wrists who have normal pronation and supination have pretty good function. Uh, if you can't supinate, you can't touch your face, you can't take change from the toll taker, although everybody has easy pass now, so that's not such a big deal, but you can't, you can't put your uh, MAC card, I just dated myself again, didn't I? Your ATM, your ATM card in the machine because you can't, you can't get your hand in space where it needs to be. Distal radial ulnar instability is probably more commonly the source of the problem than the, the actual malunion. And then the question becomes, do you treat that pathology by creating new pathology or do you restore the anatomy? And then did you miss a scaphalunate uh, interval injury, a scaphoid fracture? Uh, Midcarpal instability, check their grip strength and their, in their pinch strength. Differential diagnosis is endless. You know, you saw the statistics on carpal tunnel syndrome what was it, 5 to 7% of the population has it and 5 to 9% after distal radius fractures. Where do those circles overlap? It could be they just have carpal tunnel syndrome. It could be they have carpal tunnel syndrome that got unmasked by their, uh, by their injury. And it's that that needs to be treated, not the malunion. Again, distal radial ulnar joint is important, associated carpal instability, and make sure that they don't have tendon entrapments or adhesions that are causing their, uh, what do you call it, their uh, stiffness. Unrecognized injuries, uh, non-unions are rare, uh, malunions are common. So who do you fix? Usually the patient who has ulnar sided wrist pain with radiographic ulnar impaction uh, and symptoms that are consistent with ulnar sided wrist pain that have not resolved. Now, now that will also take forever to resolve. It may be six months or a year, so I'm never in a hurry to do something to the ulnar side of the wrist because that's the hand surgeon's black box. That's like spine surgery. I'm going to do this operation because it says I should, but I'm really going to hate my outcome. Um, it's hard to get rid of ulnar sided wrist pain, but they have, if they have ulnar impaction, then that may be legitimate. Again, distorted ulnar joint arthrosis, instability, uh, limited motion will both in, uh, decrease their functional uh, capabilities from where they can put their hand in space, and it'll produce weakness of grip. So the one that is indicated is, you saw this earlier uh, in one of the talks about the volar lip fracture that was either missed or inappropriately treated. Uh, hopefully it wasn't treated with a plate that you have to now go in and take out because they look crappy. But the, uh, the, you can see the alignment of the lunate is not collinear with the mid-shaft of the radius and this was a volar shear fracture that should have been fixed. This one I think you should fix and not wait and see how they do. 
Contraindications, patient that's infirmed who has a bad x-ray, my mom, let it alone. Unrealistic patient expectations, so you have to know what their expectations are. Be careful in a patient who's post-infection who looks like they've settled down. Uh, and patients who have poor hand function as a result of complex regional pain syndrome, some type of contractures, some type of neurovascular compromise, or that in general their pain is coming from their hand, not their wrist. If you do a corrective osteotomy for their malunion, you're going to give them two sites for pain. If you do have one that you think is amenable, then restoring anatomy, restoring function, and improving pain should be your goals, the hardest of which is going to be improving pain, because you can never prove what the source of the pain is, and some people with perfect results radiographically still have pain. So don't operate on pain. Imaging, once you decide that you're going to do something, regular x-rays, including articular views, so you know what you're dealing with, CAT scans and 3D reconstructions, I'm not going to show you a bunch of them, you all know what they would look like. And this is not a ooh-ah, this is more of a philosophical conversation we're having now. But whatever your deformity is, you can do an osteotomy to correct it. You can do an opening wedge or a closing wedge, depending on the geometry. You can do it dorsally, you can do it volarly. You can do it dorsally and fix it volarly. You can do it volarly and fix it distally. You can fix radial and or ulnar deviation uh, deformities with a uh, well-placed uh, microsagittal saw. They could be complex, and then they can be intraarticular, and those are the ones that are probably the most symptomatic and maybe the most difficult to address, depending on how late you are. Preoperative planning, as Dr. Harding pointed out, you need to have the tools of a Shriner or a Mason. You need to have an inclined board, a pencil, and a ruler, and figure out the angles as best you can so that you know what you're dealing with in terms of where your deformity is. Now, from a technique standpoint, how do I point? When I was a pup, this is what we did. Dorsally angulated distal radius, you opened them dorsally, you put a pin parallel to the joint surface, and you cut the radius. And theoretically, you let it hinge on the bottom side, and you just cranked it open until the pin was perpendicular to the table. You stuck a piece of bone graft in it, and you plated it. Worked very well. You know, same issues with dorsal plating uh, in terms of tendon irritation. And maybe this sounds heretical, but if I have to do that, I do that. Just recognize that well, I'm going to take the plate out before that happens. So yeah, I cost them two operations. But I have a hard, now, because the, the other way you do this is this way. You do it from the volar side, cut it, crank it open, and you can use your plate to fix both that malalignment and that malalignment if you have the wherewithal to do that. The, the, anybody ever done this, this way? You know, the techniques, the technique guys all look like these cartoons. Oh, yeah, just do that. <laughs> now, you got this thing on because if you, if you put this on after it's plated, it's, it, it's floating around in space. It's like trying to uh, hit a, a, b a balloon out of the air with a dart. So you put it on first. Great idea. Oh, where's your saw going to go? So you cut a little bit here, you cut a little bit there. Well, the plate's in a way. You got to loosen the plate, take the plate out, and hopefully you can put it back where it belongs. But... I don't mean to disparage it completely. It is a, a, a good idea, and I think it's better to do that so at least you have your screw holes to put where you think it's supposed to be so you have a template when you come back to fix it. But when you do, it, when you do this, now you have to open them in the back to put bone graft in, and there will be people who say, well, that's, that's added morbidity, and then there's others who say, yeah, but you saved the, the dorsal plate. I've had people get stuck on their, their extensor tendons get stuck in the bone graft. So nothing's for nothing. Whatever you're comfortable with, whatever philosophy you believe in, I think that's a reasonable, reasonable way for you to do it. If you have issues because it's late and you're not going to do the so-called add pathology to correct pathology, where you can't, everything is contracted, you can't shorten them, you're going to resect their distal ulna either by a, a matched distal ulnar resection or just whack it out if it's too long. Uh, any type of arthrodesis that covers the joint that is now uh, post-traumatically arthritic, whether it's the just the radiocarpal joint with a short fusion, uh, the distal radial ulnar joint with a capangi or a uh, total wrist fusion. And that's where timing comes in. So if you have what the definition of a nascent malunion would be one that is picked up within three or four months, I think this is most applicable to the intraarticular, where you either missed or somebody else missed that die punch where if you get to them within this time frame, you can also often tamp that thing back up and hold it there. If you wait longer than that, I'm not sure what it is you're tamping back up in terms of the quality of the cartilage, and you're making a surface. 
but that surface may not have the appropriate finish on it to, to provide what you want. Uh, established non-union would be after the fracture is healed. And those patients, in my experience, and I, again, I don't have any literature to prove this, but in my experience, those people have a specific complaint early that you know you, you can address. The late ones that have soft tissue contractures, it's almost, you know, you, you might draw all those perfect diagrams, and when you cut the bone and you go to move it, it doesn't because the soft tissues are contracted around it from having been in that radial deviated or extended position for quite a while and to do uh, enough releases might make the whole thing unstable for you again. Doesn't come without complications. Complications of any operation about the distal radius, whether it's a, a restoration of a malunion or primary fixation, you could still have a non-union. And again, so you fix the non-union with a non-union. Then that's, that's the ones where you're gonna have big gaps. So I think that you have to be prepared to bone graft them. You can lose your alignment if you don't have adequate fixation. They can get infected. The wounds can have problems. You can create nerve injuries iatrogenically. You can wake up that nascent carpal tunnel syndrome. And worst of all, you can fail to correct the deformity or fail to relieve their symptoms in terms of functions, particularly if it's pain. And all in all, you've just failed to achieve your goal. So I'll leave you with 59-year-old female, eight-year status post-distal radius fracture, who was treated in, in an exter uh, external fixator, uh, comes into the office with this. Eight years ago. Why are you here? My wrist hurts. Really. She fell two days ago, has pain on the ulnar side of her, radial side of her wrist, and she has this little styloid fracture here that's new. So she's, she's 59 and been living with this without complaints. So it's not just a little old lady, it's not just my mom who's not really sure where she is, but she remembers I'm a hand surgeon and doesn't like her wrist. Uh, but it, the, the point is it's really difficult to identify just based on the radiograph. So you have to be specific about the questions you ask the patients. What is it they can't do? It should be, if you're gonna operate on them, it should be something that you can predict that yes, that makes sense. You can't do this because you can't supinate. You can't supinate because your radius is dorsally angulated and the ulna doesn't fit in the sulcus. I can help that. But I always tell them, I'm not sure it's not gonna still hurt because we can't fix pain. So corrective osteotomy for malunited distal radius fractures can yield successful outcomes in a properly selected patient. We have the technology to correct any deformity you want and provide adequate fixation for it. Just make sure you're not operating on the x-ray. Make sure that you address their functional complaints. Osteotomies won't fix idiopathic pain. And each one of them has that same list of complications that initial operation, but so choose wisely. Thank you.